Okay, so hello everyone. And uh, today we have with us Joseph Pelican, who has been involved with the IMO for most of his history. His first participation was in 1963. And since then he has won three gold medals, a silver medal. He has acted as an organizer, a team leader, and served two terms as the chairman of IMO advisory board. Currently, he's the emeritus professor at Edwards Lorand University, and he specializes in group theory. Today, he'll be talking about Frankel's conjecture. So I hand over to Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Today, I will speak on Frankel's conjecture. So first of all, let's look at this conjecture. Here it is. It dates back to 1979, and I, I will read it out. Let F be a finite union closed family of sets, with this one exception that it should not contain the empty set alone. Then there is an element A in the union of these finitely many sets that lies in at least half of the members of F. Now, first comes an explanation, what does it mean union closed family? It means what, what you would expect from it. So it means that if it's such a family of sets that if A and B are two sets from the family, then their union also belongs to the family. So again, the conjecture says that whenever we have a finitely many sets which form a union closed family of sets, then there is an element which lies in at least half of the member. This is not so very important, this uh, uh, small remark that it's not just the empty set, but to be precise, we have to add it. You see, the empty set clearly does not satisfy the condition. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, this is such a simple statement. It really has no structure in it no complicated concepts, it just speaks about set. You could imagine that this could easily be a, a, a high school problem, for instance. But this is not the case. Despite its, its apparent simplicity, this is still an unsolved problem. And I tell you, really many people tried to solve it. So a, a, a great number of papers have been written various special cases were considered. And mind you, this, this is, we are speaking of 41 years. So I, I find this problem very attractive because it's, uh, it's on the same level of, of uh, simplicity and, and difficulty than many of the classical number theoretic conjectures. Now, before continuing, let me say a few words about the person whose name is attached to this conjecture. His uh, full name is Peter Frankl, and he was a gold medalist at the IMO in 1971. He is Hungarian, but he lives now in Japan. And he is a very colorful personality. For instance, he is a professional level juggler you know, juggling when you, you throw many balls in the air. Uh, so he is very good at that. He can do it with seven balls. Also, he speaks about uh, those and languages. Okay, so, and, and he has this conjecture. So now let's try to get a little bit more acquainted with the conjecture. First, I want to show you a couple of examples of union closed families to get a feeling what, what are the, the subject, the objects of which we are talking about in this conjecture. First comes a definition. Call an element which belongs to a union of sets abundant if it is contained in at least half of those sets, the members of F and call the element rare if it is contained in at most half of the members of F. So this is just terminology to easier formulate some of the statements. First example, 
think at some finite set, let's say number of elements be denoted by n, and look at all of its subsets. Now that means, as we know, two to the n subsets. Now every single element of the ground set S is contained in two to the n minus one subsets. That means just half of the elements. So here we see an element which is both abundant and rare. All the elements are abundant and rare at the same time. We can have a modification of this example. More generally, we can take all subsets whose cardinality is at least k, where k is some fixed number between 0 and n. It's a good exercise you, for you to check that this is, this satisfies the conjecture. It's clearly union closed, so the conjecture applies to it. And check it. Let's look at another example. Example number two. Again, we, we take a, a set of, a finite set of size n, and now we fix an element of that set, a. And let F, the family be the collection of all subsets of S which contain A. There are two to the n minus one such sets. And we take one more set to the family F, namely the empty set. Then the cardinality of the family F is two to the n minus one plus half, plus one. And A is contained in all of those sets except the empty set. So it is contained in much more than one half, close to all of the member sets of the family. So A is an abundant element. But all the element, other elements of S, which are different from A, they are contained in two to the n minus two member sets, which is a bit below one half of all the member sets. So you see here we have an example where there is just one abundant element and all the others are rare, but at least we have the one element. Now we could do, we will see a still more examples later, but now let me continue. If you, if you start reflecting, how could I possibly prove it? It's quite a natural idea to try to use induction. He, well, induction with respect to what parameter? You see, here we really have an abundance of parameters for which we can try to apply induction. For instance, the cardinality of F, that is the number of the member sets. The cardinality of the union, which means the ground set, where, which contains precisely those elements which belong to at least one member set. What happens outside this set is uninteresting for us. Actually, this second uh, parameter seems even a little bit more natural than the first, because actually we can reformulate everything here not speaking of union closed sets in general and union closed families, but rather to say that we have a finite set and we look at certain subsets of it which satisfy the union closed property. I insert a small remark here. I said that I take a finite set and its subsets, whereas apparently in the original formulation of Frankl's conjecture, the sets were not finite. There were finitely many, but we never said that they are finite. Now, this is unimportant because you can, you can easily prove that if Frankl's conjecture is true for finite sets, which are themselves finite, not just finitely many, or for general sets, but just finitely many of them, the two cases are equivalent. So from now on, we can safely assume that all sets in, in sight are finite. Okay, a third candidate for a suitable parameter is the size of the smallest member set. Maybe we can, it's more suitable for induction. Mind you, the size of the largest member set is not a candidate 
not a suitable parameter because it will always be the union, the cardinality of the union. If you disregard elements which do not belong to any side. Okay, so let's try. Bad news. If you, many people tried many type of induction, and it no one of them worked out. So what? It is often the case that a stronger statement is easier to prove by induction. Aha, uh -huh. so that, that's an idea. By the way, as, as experienced problem solvers, you certainly know this phenomenon, that a stronger statement might be easier to prove by induction. Question is, what is the reason for that? Well, I, I think the first reason is that uh, that the stronger statement may be better suited for the induction step. In the concrete cases which I met, this was almost always the, the situation. But there is another possible reason which I read in, in some uh, paper of, of Tim Gowers, yesterday's speaker on this same place. He, he says that it might be easier to prove the stronger statement because there are fewer ways open for you to try. That's a good observation. Anyway, let's, let's try to apply this observation to our particular situation. The first step is to look at, at the situation where F contains a one element set. Then it's certainly the size of the smallest member set apart from a possible empty set. And then it's an almost trivial remark then, then these element, the element of any one element set which, con which is contained in F, this is abundant. You immediately see the reason. Whenever you have a, a, a member set which does not contain A, we take the union of it with A. By the union clause property, this, this is also a member set. So there are at least as many member sets which contain A than the ones which do not contain A. So this is, this is trivial. Okay, let's look at the case where F contains a two element set. Even if it, I allow that it contains also a one element set, but then we are already done. So we safely can assume that in this situation, this two element set is one of the smallest ones. Then I leave it to you as an easy exercise at least one of the elements A or B, maybe both, are abundant. Good. So next case, if F contains a three element set, then, and now we, what do we expect? If we now again find that one of A, B, C is abundant, then perhaps we are on, the, on a good trace. We were lucky that this, this modified stronger statement could be proved somehow by induction. So this is the question. Is it true that under this condition, one of ABC is abundant? If you try this yourself, then you work hard on proving it, no success. You work hard finding a counter example and it's not easy to find a counterexample. Here is one counterexample. You see, what, what do you see? You see nine, a nine element finite set and some subsets of it, namely 27 subsets. Now you should check that this is indeed a union closed family. It's quite small in the sense that you see a nine element set has two to the nine, that is 512 subsets, and we only use 27 of those. And here, if you look at the example, you can see that the, the smallest set is this, the one, two, three, okay? And none of its elements are abundant because if you check it, each is contained in only 13 member sets, which is slightly less than half of 27. So the, our observation does not hold for three element sets. But hang on, the original conjecture still holds. So 
there are abundant elements in this set. For instance, four is contained in almost all of, of the member sets, in 23 out of the 27. So we tried this road, it does not work. Now, before continuing our tries, it's another good approach if you are hopeless in, after a, many efforts, trying to prove or trying to disprove something, then sometimes it's a good idea to try to formulate an equivalent problem in some quite other setting, which is more easy to attack. And indeed, this Frankel's conjecture has many equivalent variants. I just show you one of those variants, the graph theoretic variant. Again, we, we start with a few definitions. If we have a graph, I have in mind a simple graph without uh, loops and multiple edges and undirected. So in a graph, an independent set is a set of vertices such that no two of vertices of the set are connected by an edge. So it's, it's just, if you, if you use usual graph theory terminology, independent set is a, is a set of vertices such that the subgraph spanned by them is the empty graph. Empty graph is the complementary graph of the complete graph. And now another terminology, a maximal independent set is an independent set which is not contained in any larger independent set. So mind you, it, it, maximal independent does not mean that it is, it is big by the number of elements, but that it's not contained in any larger. Okay, so we have this terminology, and now comes the conjecture. In a graph is at least one edge, so not the empty set, the empty graph. There are always two adjacent vertices, each belonging to at most, at most half of the maximal independent sets. Uh, let me have a quick look at the, the most important observation with respect to this conjecture. This conjecture is equivalent to Frankel's conjecture. If you can prove this, then you have proved Frankel's conjecture and vice versa. Now, before continuing, let me, let me show you a case of, of this situation. So what does this conjecture say in the graph theoretic setting? Let's look, uh, I, I cannot draw pictures with my present equipment here, but I, I try to explain it in words. Look at a square. That's, that's a graph with four vertices and four edges. And add one of the diagonals. Then you have four vertices and five edges. Now, what are the maximal independent sets in this, five, in this graph? Well, in every graph, every one element set is independent. That's clear. Now, here there are two vertices, in my example, which have degree three. They are connected with every other vertex. They are clearly maximal independent sets. You cannot add any other vertex. So I have two one element independent, maximal independent sets the two endpoints of the diagonals, and the remaining two points which are not connected, they clearly form a maximal independent set of cardinality two. So I have three maximal independent sets in my graph, two of one element and one with two element, and every element belongs exactly one of them, so less than half of the number of all maximal independent sets. So we check the, that the conjecture is true in, in this very easy example. But more generally, it's easy to prove for graphs which are not bipartite graphs. You know, bipartite graphs are graphs where the vertex set is, is uh, partitioned into two parts and edges go only between the two sets and not within any of the one or the other set. That's what is called bipartite graphs. They, they seem to be very special type of 
graphs. By the way, an equivalent definition is a graph which uh, does not contain an odd circle. Circuit. Okay. Now, surprisingly, for not bipartite graphs, which are in a sense the majority of all graphs, the, con the conjecture is very easy to prove. So what remains is to verify it for bipartite graphs, and that's the difficult part. There are many partial results in this direction. One partial result is when our bipartite graph has, uh, every vertex has degree at most three, which is admittedly a very special case, but not quite trivial. Then Frankl's conjecture is true. But for general bipartite graphs is, is wide open. Let me, let me take a, another look for, from another perspective. I, I explain it here. When one meets such a conjecture, it's a natural first step to try to construct counterexamples for small values of the parameters or equivalently to try to prove small for small values of the parameters, uh, in particular to get a feeling how it works out. The following list indicates that there are no small counterexamples. Uh, again, we, we will look at some of the possible parameters. Here, here are the examples which I want to single out. We will denote by n the total number of elements, so the cardinality of the union of the member sets, and I will denote by m the number of the member sets, so the cardinality of the union closed family. And here you see partial results. If the total number of points is at most 12, then it has been verified that it's true. If the number of the member sets, it can be as high as 50, still it's verified for that case. And the third condition is a bit different. It says that if, if you have many member sets, so the family is big, namely it contains at least half of all the subsets. Its cardinality is at least two to the n minus one. Then it has also been verified for this case. So you see, don't try to, to get counterexamples with 30 sets. There is no such. Now let me, let me finish by an observation which again sheds some more light on this conjecture. Here is a question for which still unknown the answer. I read, read out the question. Is it true that for every union closed family of sets F, there is an element which is contained in at least 1% of all the member sets of L. So you see, instead of asking to find an element which is contained in at least half, so one over two of all member sets, you ask to find an element which is contained in at least one over 100 of the member sets. And this, this is also answered, this question. Of course, 1% is an arbitrary number here. It, it just expresses the fact that there is no, no constant for which we could prove that, that have to at least see part of all member sets. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Joseph. That was a nice talk. Um, if there are any questions, please put them in the chat. So Freddie asks, why is the graph theoretic version equivalent to Frankel's conjecture? Well, it's not trivial that this is equivalent. That, that's a theorem, not very, you can try your end that is. It's not as difficult as the, as the conjecture itself, but it's, it's, uh, it's, I don't know, maybe a one page proof. Okay. And roughly how were the results like for M less than 50 in, in the last slide, you say that it has been proven for M less than 50 and that feels like 
an arbitrary number. So is there a reason the 50 comes up? Look, I, I don't guarantee that those numbers are, are the most up to date. What, what I was careful about that they should be true. So okay. these are the numbers which I could uh, trace in the literature. But it's completely possible that someone uh, half a year ago proved that for M less than or equal than 75. Okay. Incidentally, I have difficulties uh, seeing the Zoom screen. Uh, you can end sharing now. I, that should be fine. Uh huh. I see. Right. Good. And uh, lastly, so uh, the union closed families, that's, I mean, th does this have any consequences in topological terms? So the fact that Frank if Frankel's conjecture is true, does it translate to any nice properties in topological terms? I, I don't know topological equivalent, but there is an equivalent which is perhaps even more promising than the graph theoretic one. There is a lattice theoretic equivalent. Mind you, lattice here means a, a partially ordered set where many two elements have a join and a meet. So not, not n-dimensional regular <laughs> arrangement of points. So a lattice theoretic version it, particularly many papers have been written on that, but these did not manage to prove the original conjecture. I see. And so in your research, do you actively try to solve the Frankel's conjecture or is this just something cool that you know? I, I never tried that my hand at it. I believe the mathematical community. <laughs> if okay. those clever guys could not solve it, then I... I don't waste my time on that, but, but I, I really find it a fascinating thing. In, in my mind, it is something in, in the same category as say the twin prime conjecture. You I are see. something which, which uses absolutely no concepts. The, the statement is completely clear. By the way, at first sight, it might be, it might look very improbable. Hmm. You can imagine that, that there is no, no limit or quite independent, but if this true, then why not prove it in, in hmm. just a few lines? I it's see. fascinating. I tell you, one of my secret thoughts when I chose this as the topic of my talk would be that maybe I can encourage one of the clever guys sitting here to try their hand, but don't, don't waste too many times. So, on it, I warn you. But please, perhaps you can look at it with a with a with a fresh look. Okay. And um, so another question asks: What are the applications or consequences of Frankel's conjecture? So, if it is true, what can uh, we? Expect? There are consequences. In particular, there are some papers of Frankel himself, written with co-authors. But uh, the conjectures are still, I mean, I, the consequences are still of combinatorial nature. So it, it doesn't help you to, to solve Riemann's conjecture. <laughs> okay. So if there are no more questions related to the talk, we can proceed to the general interview. Please. Okay. So. Right, so you have been involved with the IMO for most of its history. And how do you think it has changed over the years from 1963 to 2020? What is your experience with over the years? Well, there, there, a lot of things can be said what did change. Obviously, the size of it changed. I, I tell you the story how it all started, because it's not widely known. So it did not start in a way that people said, let's try to organize an international mathematical Olympiad. What actually happened was that in the year 1959, the Romanian Mathematical Society had some sort of anniversary. And they said that a good way to celebrate it would be to invite students from the other, as they called it, socialist countries at that time. So basically, Eastern European and Middle European countries 
for a, for a two-day mathematics competition. And indeed, they do it. They invited six other countries. So there were seven countries going to, to Romania. And they had indeed a competition of two days. And, and when it, it was finished, the team leaders told among themselves that, hey, this is quite a good thing. Why should we not repeat it next year? And so they repeated it next year. Again, Romania invited the very same countries. Not all of them came, but, uh, but some. And there was a second International Mathematical Olympiad, as you could call it by that time. And everybody agreed that it's still a good idea to continue, but the Romanians said that please someone else organize it because we already did it twice. So Hungary ventured and the third IMO was in Hungary. And next year, the IMO was in Czechoslovakia. There was such a country at that time. Uh, and, and the fifth was in Poland, the sixth was in, in, in Moscow. The seventh was in East Berlin, and the eighth was in, in Bulgaria. I know those ones because those were the four ones where I participated. When I first participated in, in 63, I was 15 years old, <laughs> and I got a silver medal. Okay, so, so this, the next year, when I was already not there, in, that was the year 67, that was Yugoslavia, and that made already a difference, because although Yugoslavia in those days was a, a socialist country, but a, a little bit different from the other socialist countries, they were more independent, so to say. So they could afford to invite some of the Western countries, which until that time was, was not feasible. So countries like Italy and Great Britain came to the 67 IMO. So it, it started to enlarge. And this, this sort of continuously continued, more and more countries basically from Western Europe joined. And then came a point when, when some non-European countries joined. The first such country, by the way, was Mongolia, because it, was, it still counted as a socialist country. So it was, it participated, for instance, I remember in, in Moscow in 64, there was a Mongolian team. And then the countries from Asia joined, countries from a America, in particular the US joined after a while. And, and then every continent, during the time when, when I was the chairman of this advisory board, one of our main concerns was to try to involve more and more African countries. Because in those years, uh, Africa was the only continent which, which lagged behind in the number of participants. You see, this situation by now has significantly changed. We have a lot of African countries. So you see, this is uh, how almost every year there were more countries than the previous year and more students than the previous year, which by the way meant that uh, it became more and more difficult to organize. And when that became apparent uh, in, in 1981, when the US organized it, that was the last IMO when there were teams of eight students. Next year, Hungary organized it in 82, and Hungary invited only four member teams. And then, then the next year in 83, France took a compromise and it invited six member teams. And this is the case since then. So now you, you think that it is a natural thing to have six member teams, but it's, it's, a, it's a historical development, so to say. By the way, even so, the IMO is, has the, the largest teams among science Olympiads. You see in physics, there are five member teams, in informatics and chemistry, four member teams. Mm -hmm. So we still are the, run the largest teams. Okay, so that much about the size. And of course, many did, you see, at the first few IMOs, 
the next IMO was not decided by any particular process, but it happened that at the end of every IMO, some leader of some country came forward and said that we decided to organize the next IMO. You are invited, please come. And that was it. And that worked quite well until one year, nobody came forward. But people still hoped that there will be something and hoped and hoped and there, there did not. There was no IMO in one particular year, the late, late uh, 70s. Okay, so uh, it was decided that this situation should somehow be remedied and the so-called site committee was formed, whose job was to pick future organizers. And, and uh, since then, as you can see, there is a, an IMO every year, even under such heavy conditions as we are having this year. So the site committee did its job and, and later it was renamed advisory board because it turned out that there are many other businesses to be uh, done between two IMOs, for instance. And lately the advisory board have been shortened to board. So now <laughs> we, have, we have board, IMO board. Another change was that at the first IMOs, and I remember not only the ones when I was a student, because then of course I didn't see much of how it is run. I was sitting on the other side of it. But some year later when Hungary organized again, I was an interpreter and uh, coordinator, whatever. And I saw how things are running with the, with the team leaders. And the team leaders spent an enormous no amount of time on discussing whether a certain problem should be evaluated at six points or seven or eight. Really, there were clever arguments for one, clever arguments for the other, and a huge amount of time went in wasting. So at some of the early IMOs, it was decided that every problem is worth seven points. If it is difficult, then because of that, if it is easy, then because of that. <laughs> there is no discussion how many points should be awarded. That's one great progress. And another great progress that uh, the, the problems at the very first IMOs were chosen that the, the team leaders who gathered pulled out a paper from their pocket and said that I propose this problem. <laughs> and the others said, without, without knowing what the solution is, that, oh, that's a nice problem, let's, let's propose it. And this is clearly an unsatisfactory procedure. And so slowly it was introduced that uh, the problem proposers are sent well in advance to the organizing country who the organizing country on, on her part uh, uh, produces a problem selection committee and then several people work hard for several weeks, even months, and the jury gets a, a well-balanced uh, short and short proposal of, of problems and can choose from them. Today we could not follow this procedure because the jury was not available but there was a problem selection committee who had full power, so to say. Okay. And one more very important thing, that's the question of coordinators. They did not exist at the very first IMOs. Every team leader uh, looked at the paper of, of his own students and evaluated it. Now, this is clearly again something unsatisfactory. Not only that, they, they have different ideas about how many points a, a certain partial solution is worth, but also because clearly team leaders tend to give more points to their own students <laughs> in any case of doubt. So it was first it was introduced that the team leader of the problem, of, of the, con so the team leader of the country which proposed a particular problem went through all countries and looked at their solutions and said, this is okay, this is too much points and, and so on. But that was clearly again, not satisfactory in particular because these poor team leaders had such a huge amount of job to do that they could not manage it. Right. So it started that the organizing country 
pro provides so-called coordinators, experts, and they help to evaluate the problems. Okay, so these are just, uh, this was a long answer, I realized, mm -hmm. but uh, IMO had a long development. It's, it's really great. It's really great to listen to it. So where do you think is the IMO heading in the future? Because I think I recently read an article about artificial intelligence participating in the IMO. So what, what do you think about the future? How it will uh, develop that. Look, uh, from time to time, it is a concern that the IMO is getting too big and too expensive and impossible to handle. A refutation for that is that every year there is an IMO. <laughs> so there is always some country, and sometimes there are several candidates for a particular year. Now, again, we are in a, in a difficult situation due to the virus, but I, I am confident that IMO will continue to develop until it, it comprises almost all the countries of the world. Mind you, <laughs> we are well over 100 these days with, uh, with participating countries. If you imagine that starting seven, then you can see that uh, this is a, it has a, a, a diagram which, which so shows quite clear tendencies. Right. So I think uh, really it's, well, that's why it was an important step to reduce the number of, of participants inside a team, because I think with eight teams, it would be really, really very, very difficult these days. But having six member teams uh, seems to be manageable at the moment. Maybe, maybe there comes some time when we have to rethink this, but at, at, at the moment, I, and I feel it's in good hands, the IMO at the moment. So the board is doing a good job. And uh, in particular, this year, Jeff did a, a, an incredible job, but many other people can be mentioned. So there was an idea a couple of years ago that let's split it into, into regional IMOs and only the winners of those come to together at a central final IMO. Now this is completely against the spirit of the IMO. I would very much disapprove if, if it ever occurred again, this idea, because one of the reasons IMO is so good is that the students can, can meet each other, see what problems are done in other countries. They can, they can get a lot of experience. If there would be some eliminating uh, pro procedure uh, that would not give the advantage of, say, countries which are newer to this problem-solving business. So it, it, it's really important, the integrity. And you see also the IMO problems, as they are selected these days, they are a good indication for many other countries. And to see experience this on the spot is, is something which I think is a very great uh, experience for, for any of the participants at IMO. Wonderful. Yeah, that's a great answer. So uh, I understand that you are a group theorist. So w what does group theory at a research level look like? Can you describe <laughs> your research? Group theory is one of the most active fields of, of research these days. And groups are, are very important objects, not in themselves, but because, because they occur everywhere, unbeknownst to, to most people. But wherever there is some symmetry, then there are some groups, groups of symmetry. And symmetry is everywhere. And you now, of course, if you hear symmetry, you think something like a mirror or or an animal which had both sides similar. But, but there are much more complicated similarities. And it was in group theory that one of the greatest achievements of mathematics of all ages was achieved some decades ago, which is called the classification of the finite simple groups. Mm. Now, you see, simple groups are quite complicated objects despite <laughs> their names. But they are finite 
simple groups. I, I will not give you the definition of what is a simple group, right. but only tell you that uh, these were discovered, these finite simple groups, during a period of roughly 100 years, second half of the 19th century and first half of the 20th century, even the middle of the 20th century. And as a, as a result of the combined efforts of many, many people, very good mathematicians, there was a list of 17 infinite sequences of finite simple groups and 26 so-called exceptional groups, which did not fit in any of the infinite sequences. Now, already, already to define all these groups is quite a job. Maybe it would take a full book. There are some similar books, by the way. Okay. But the question was, are there any more? And uh, after a long combined effort of decades of many people, by now it's generally accepted that is, it is proved, it is a theorem, that this is the full list of finite simple groups. There are no more. Okay. And it's, it's not written down at any particular place, but it's scattered in many mathematical journals. And, <laughs> and the estimated total length of the proof is 15,000 pages, which is in a way the greatest intellectual achievement of mankind, in a way, of course, in inventing the wheel was a greater achievement. But... <laughs> so this is this is a huge theorem. It, it's a very important theorem. There are lots of consequences from it. I see. And so, so th this is what is very attractive in group theory. Okay. So, do you have any advice for the young mathematicians here? Well, it's, it's hard to give advice. Okay. But certainly they should work hard. That, that, that's absolutely clear. But I think by now that has become clear for them, even if it was not clear uh, some time before, because you don't get to the IMO team of your country unless you work hard. That's mm. clear. And then, yeah. And then, yes. So... so but other than that, be patient, work hard, and be happy when you find something. <laughs> That's nice. So on that note, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank Joseph for his time and the amazing interview we had. And I would like, so there's a question by Freddie. How do you deal with the stress of trying open problems? How do you? How does one deal with the stress of trying open problems? So, it must be hard, and these problems have been. The people have one been trying them for centuries. Is, is not not to try very famous problems because you are, <laughs> you are, very likely to, to have disappointment. Right. Be modest. <laughs> That's another way to formulate it. Great. That's good advice. If there are any more questions. I think that's it. Thank you very much, Joseph. And thank you to everyone who's present. Thank that you was for watching and asking. Thank you. <laughs>